Welcome to Patty. the podcast. <laughs> Patty at the helm. Oh, hey. Patty in the driver's seat. Scary. So Cameron's out, and we have lots of buttons and lots of time. Yeah, he's at the beach with his family. So what I think we should do is call him. Oh, just like I'm ju- down with that. Just to see if he'll answer. Let's do it. And uh, and I'll just hold him up to the to my microphone if he answers. All right, let's see if he answers. He better answer. I told him, in fact, if you're on vacation, dude, and I call you, you need to answer. So we'll see if he answers. Hello? Hey, dude, what are you doing? Oh, you know, just about to go to the pool or the beach, trying to decide. Dude, whatever, bro. All right. <laughs> just got down with a round of golf. Oh, did you? Yeah. How'd you play? Uh, Front nine, not terrible. Back nine, not sight. Did you get Taylor to go with you? No, I went play with Madison this time. Okay. Cool, dude. Yeah. Well, that's great. Is the weather good? Yeah, it's been great. Awesome. It's been really good. Well, I, I probably should have told you this before, but you're you're live on the podcast right now because oh, nice. Hey. <laughs> we couldn't do it without ha- at least hearing your voice. Felt so weird. Here I am. I know. Patty's in the chair, dude. She may like it. I'm, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. So we won't keep you on for the whole thing, but we just wanted to say hey, and you were definitely missed. Well, I'm glad to at least have my voice on it. Absolutely. Even though you're at Hilton Head and we're not. And enjoying life. Yeah. Nice. All right, buddy. All yep. Right. Have See a great you, week. See you, buddy. Bye. Yeah, it didn't make me feel any better. So nothing like crashing someone else's vacation. 100%. Just for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. I mean, they expect me to call just to say, hey. Oh, it's expected. Well, yeah. Well, because, I mean, I do the, like when I'm on vacation, I'll call you guys like, hey, what y'all doing? Hmm. Just because, you know. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, they, don't don't call me on vacation. No, well, I'll call Joey. <laughs> hey, Joey, what's Patty doing? <laughs> yeah, that'll go great. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Joe's like, what are you calling me for? Right. And I see what you're doing, and I know where you are. Oh, scary. Yes. Um, okay, deflect. But yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I'm just never, I've never been one of those guys that everybody says, hey, go to the beach, turn it off, don't think about it. And I'm like, I mean, I don't know. Because... Like, I don't think about the day-to-day as much, but I think about my friends. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Like, because, I mean, we hang out. Think about that. Like, we spend more time together mm-hmm. than a lot of people do, with, you know, right. even with family sometimes and stuff. So, I mean, and you've got staff that you've been with for three or four years. Mm-hmm. You're like, man, I miss my friends. That's true. So, and I guess that's good, though. Yeah, I guess that's good, though. It is good. Yeah. And he felt loved and validated. Probably, well, maybe. Something like that. Yeah, or like, why did he call me? Yeah. Which I don't care. We're going to go with I'm, love I'm going to call him again. <laughs> That's right. I'll call him again later. Nice. <laughs> All right. So I got a funny for you. Oh, okay. I think people <laughs> I think people enjoy learning these things. So, oh, okay. So I am, uh, I don't know if you're this way or not, but I'm one of those guys that, uh, like if I go to the store and buy something and it's like $6.66, I'm going to buy something else. Like it's just not going, I'm just not going to let it land on the mark of the beast. Right. <laughs> Are you that way? <laughs> there you go. So, so, so when I pump gas, like I'll, I look at the the price and the gallons to make sure, like it's you know it's not even close. Oh you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So what's frustrating right now is my car odometer is like on six six, and then you know it's like so it's like I don't know 125 thousand whatever six hundred and sixty miles. Wow. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm gonna have to deal with that for a week. You know, so I, so I just drive down the road and I don't look at it. Like it's not like I act like it's, <laughs> it's not, not there. Real. So when it hits six, 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 I'll be, I won't be like, or maybe I should look at it and just pray the whole time it's on that. I don't know. That's probably, you think better, that's weird? Better strategy. I think it's common actually. I think it's very common. I do. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, thanks for the confidence. <laughs> Hey, I'm just not going to let it land on. Yeah, I'm not going to let it land on the market. Isn't that funny, though? Because like it doesn't like that doesn't mean it means nothing. You know what I mean? It really does. But at the same time, I'm just like, yeah, Jesus said that's the mark of the beast. and I don't want to be in way around it. Mm -hmm. Not getting the T-shirt. What if you got a I've seen this before. What if you got a license plate and your license plate was like whatever, whatever, six, six, six. Would you you ask him? Would you ask him for a new one? Definitely. Yeah. Would you? Yeah, see, that's when I would get, like, I want the Tennessee special plate for $100. Like, I'll do whatever yeah. I got to do not to have that as my yeah. license plate number. Yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah. Interesting. It might propel us into cool stature. Like if I got the one that said like hike Tennessee, people would think I was athletic. But then it said six six six. Right. What about that? So you'd be like I don't know. Yeah. A demon hiker or something. No, I meant if I had to get rid of and, and get a specialized plate. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I could that was, yeah. up my status. hundred percent. Anyways, no, I'm not Yeah. Good. And so I went home for lunch and I was excited to go home for lunch because I was waiting for a box. So guess what I was waiting for in the box? Mm, let me think. Um, blow mold. That's a great guess. <laughs> but I was waiting for replacement antlers and a snowman pipe. For the blow mold. <laughs> yeah. How funny was that? I'm like, yes, my box is here and I'm tearing it open. I'm like, oh, my antlers. Yeah, because I've got my other six reindeer that I need to complete the set of nine. I think some intercessory prayer is necessary. No, 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 no. We're flying them. There's a true addiction. Mm. <laughs> it's just my personality. Like when I'm in, I'm in. It's actually, you know, it's so actually quite fun. It is a lot of fun. It's going to be great this year when they're like flying through the air. But, long, but not on the roof. As long as my project manager, Stuart Knowles, comes through. <laughs> Blow Mold Central project manager. Blow Mold Central. Yep. It's awesome. You want to introduce our new uh, yeah. roadie intern so slash. In the, in the corner that you guys can't see, we have Miss Crystal. And she'll be working with Cameron and I somehow, keeping us straight. Why are you whispering? I'm not sure. <laughs> did you notice you did that? Hello. You're like. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my podcast voice oh sorry yeah it's so crystal's same. here crystal's she got here. us all set up she's amazing yep she called Cameron she's too. over there in the chair <laughs> judging me right now look at her she That's is okay. she's like oh nice do you know what blow mold is do you know the plastic um christmas old yeah. like old plastic things you put in your yard yeah so i got a few of those he has many there yeah, are many. Got, well, yeah. So I had a, a sleigh and three reindeer. I mean, he didn't have three. He didn't have three reindeer. You know, yeah. So, but they're very hard to find. But I found the other six, so I'm good now. Your dealer found them. My dealer. I've got a great guy that's a dealer. Yeah, that's I've got awesome. a blow mode dealer. So he goes and he finds this stuff, and like he tells me, and I believe him. Like I'm one of his first calls, if not the first call. Hey, I just found this. Do you want it? I guess what's? Can you meet me here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, look, don't tell, do? don't tell anybody else. Yeah, meet me behind the alley. That's awesome. And we're, yeah, so it's So, good. Jeff, we missed our opportunity. We could have played any song we wanted. Oh, I know. Well, Cameron wasn't here. I know. Well, but I don't know that we know how to, do you know how to do that, Crystal though? does. Oh, see? <laughs> Great. We do not. Well, there you go. Actually, you can just pull it up on your phone. And so, I guess, it. I know I could do that, but that would be terrible. It so, would. I guess we have to talk about. But it's fine. <laughs> the it's message all fine and, and the message was amazing yesterday thank you yeah it's, it's a great series i mean it's a great it's just neat how it all falls out when you look at it like that that's yeah. why i love to preach through books absolutely and i love the parallel in what we're going through as a church absolutely as a whole because we're people just like the people were people then with right. a job to do and so the same um afflictions and, and issues that they face, some of those are coming our way. Absolutely. So we have to be prepared for that. <clears throat> but you know, it's, it's, and I mentioned this yesterday in the, in the service, that it is, it really is intimidating to me to use an army illustration when you have a three star general sitting on your, the second pew. You know, I just know exactly where, where they sit, you know, General Pickler and his wife. And so I'm like, anytime I'm even like working something up or whatever, I'm like, oh, this would be a great illustration for this. And I think, Oh man, I like, like I bet General Pickles gonna be like, yeah, that's not right, that's right. not true. Like because you know, I mean, there's not just not that many three star generals in in the country, and we happen to have one in our church. Are there mannerisms which point you or, or lead you to believe you're spot on, or try again? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't know, like, but so I kind of threw it out there, thinking he would give me like a nod or a thumbs up or yeah, you're on track, and it was. It was so cool. We, you weren't in there because you were, you were doing the uh, rehearsal for the 10 o'clock service, right? Right. So I did the illustration, and I talked about the rules of engagement for war. And I prefaced it. I said, hey, I said, like, I get it, you know, General Pickler. I mean, this may not – I'm just – this is what I found. So I read through it, and all of a sudden, like, real loud, he went, ooh-ah. <laughs> like, loud. I'm like, oh, wow. Wow. So that's like an army amen, I think. Yeah. Like, that's what the army, like, I think that was their kind of battle cry. An affirmative. Yeah. He's like, ooh, ah. You know, I was like, oh, that's cool. So 
So I was good. Yeah, I was good the rest of the morning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was good. So you felt good about yourself. Um, for 10 minutes. For <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, right? There so you go. with our message, we didn't receive any questions yesterday. So yeah. I think you're quite thorough. <laughs> well, I, you wonder that or uh, I don't know if it's just us. But it seems like this is a real busy time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think people are really busy. I know several of our families, like, came to Sunday school and had to go to the ballpark. Like, I just think that's just a, it's just a busy time of the year leading into fall break. And I think people were, like, very engaged, listening, all in, but then, you know, yeah. kind of out. And I think Cameron does a good job of reminding people yeah. that. And I just forget. I mean, we don't think about it, you know. Yeah, but I sure. think he does, so. So I think our, our structure for today will just be to simply walk through your your sermon notes. If there are any things that you feel like, you know, I didn't have time to elaborate or even get to that. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good opportunity for us to do that. And I don't know if you've noticed my nerdy self sitting in the corner with my notepad. I have like a big clipboard now. I d- yes, I like, do. Yeah. You're over on. there. Yeah. Like printing it out, taking notes. That's yeah. awesome. It helps me just, you know, again, I might have questions as well right. for when we get into the podcast. So, um, and you never know. So I'm just going to start from the top. And the first point that you made was to know our enemy and you referenced Nehemiah 2.19. Yep. Yeah. We talked about, uh, because, because Nehemiah has, and it's interesting how he has these same three guys that are, that are going to give him problems all through the book of Nehemiah. Um, and, I, and I love how Nehemiah is so real, you know, and I think one of the things that we'll get into, we may even do that this Sunday when we're going to have service planning here in just a little bit, but the prayers of Nehemiah are just so real mm-hmm. and down to earth, you know, and, and you don't get from a guy like Nehemiah, um, I don't know, like, I don't know if it was just in the work, but the, I know the nine prayers that we have recorded from Nehemiah, like are very straightforward, like Nehemiah will in a second pray, uh, God, do do double to them what they wanted to happen to me. Right. You know, it's almost like this, oh, my goodness, man, where's this, oh, Lord, forgive them and all this. Mm-hmm. Kind of, Nehemiah's like, no, 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 Lord, you get, give them what they deserve. Right. You know, he's kind of that uh, that passionate in his prayers because he knew how important his work was and what God had called him to do. And he knew that all they were doing, all they were trying to do was to pull him away from the work. Mm-hmm. And so you've got these guys, San- Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, that, that are benefiting from really the the unprotected group of Israelites, mm-hmm. you know, because they were scattered, they were unprotected, things were in rubble. Well, as long as that was the case, they could, I mean, they could take advantage of them. Yeah, and that's exactly what they were doing. They were mm-hmm. taking advantage of them for personal gain. And as soon as Nehemiah, you know, that's the one thing that I think I probably didn't mention yesterday that we that we need to understand is that what Satan doesn't want us to do is is stand in our identity in Christ. Mm-hmm. Right, because once they start standing, once once Israel got the walls built and they started regaining that identity as, as the people of God and this is the city of God and this is where the temple is and where the sacrifice, you know, and all that starts coming back, there's a level of confidence that comes back. Yeah. And, you know, you think about Israel today. Like, it is amazing how small Israel is today, but nobody messes with Israel, mm-hmm. You're right? And you always want to find yourself on the side of Israel. Like as I think as the United States, we always want to find ourselves on the side with Israel because even though, uh, man, Jesus came and, I, you know, he brought redemption to all of us and he grafted us as Gentiles into the family of God, man, Israel's still God's chosen people and it's still his chosen nation. So when he returns, he's going to return to Jerusalem yeah, and he's going to reign from Jerusalem. So um, I think, even back then, I think Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, all those people, are, they knew that. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that, that Julie and I were talking about that I think we forget sometimes, especially with like Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, uh, Xerxes, and even Artaxerxes, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, we talked about this a little bit last week. You know, the, all those guys were polytheistic. You know, so, right. so, so it wasn't like we are today where people are atheist, anti-God, I mean, back then they were they were pro God. They were just pro God's plural, mm-hmm. you know. And so they had all they had all of these different gods, and and so they definitely wanted the God of the Israelites because Yahweh will even be referred to that way, you know, the God of the Israelites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you hear Nebuchadnezzar referring to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, those types of things. So they were they were pro gods, 
And, you know, I think that's why a part of why the, why the favor was on them to go do what they did. Because mm-hmm. <clears throat> they were still, even, even Nehemiah going back and rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, they were still under Persian rule. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like they had their freedom. They just were given permission to go do this. That's why Sanballat said in chapter 2, why are you rebelling against the king? Mm-hmm. Because if <clears throat> they destroyed, of course, that happened with Nebuchadnezzar, but if they destroyed that, uh, you know, he, he's accusing him of rebelling against the king when he actually had orders from the king to go back and do that. Right. And right? you wonder why Nehemiah's response wasn't, well, why are you rebelling against the king of the universe? <clears throat> right? Yeah. He yeah. could have dropped that. No, he, you know, he could absolutely have dropped that. But I just, I think Nehemiah was so single focused on what his task was in front of him. Mm-hmm. And his task was not to convince Sambalot that he was right. Mm-hmm. And, and I think, man, there's, there's so much, uh, even as we get into the rest of the message, there's so much that, we've, that we can take from that that we have to understand. And I think this is a distraction from the work, mm-hmm. is us being right. That's true. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, like we feel like we've got this, this in us that says, no, 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 I've got to be right here. Mm-hmm. I've got to win that argument. That person needs to know that this is the truth. Well, Nehemiah wasn't concerned at all mm-hmm. about Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem knowing he was right. 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 He wasn't even concerned about defending himself. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, th- I think that's such a such a great lesson for us because we want to defend ourselves. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure you know I'm right. You know, one of the things I w- that I tell parents all the time uh, that we've learned over the years since our kids are the age they are and even now as they're older, but especially when they were younger, is that everything is not a battle and you don't always have to win, Mm -hmm. right? Because as a young parent, you think, I've got to win every battle or the kid's going to think he's in charge. And I think there's a lot that can be taught through helping them understand, listen, because here's the problem. If, If you have to be right all the time, somebody has to be wrong. Right. And so when it's always an issue of right and wrong, there's always an issue of blame. And so think about yeah. that. So, so when you have, and, and you know, you, in, we saw it in student ministry when we'd finally get these kids in student ministry. And by that time, they were so angry at their moms and dads, it, it was difficult to kind of peel that onion and try to get to the core of what was happening. Right. And a lot of times, what we would find is, is that there was such a, an environment in the home of right of somebody had to be right and which meant somebody had to be wrong which meant somebody had to be blamed Mm -hmm. and the kids felt like it was always them right because because they were they were always on the losing end of that you know and so because of that now you've got these kids who are angry they're frustrated Mm -hmm. now they start rebelling you know and we think rebellion is natural there's a catalyst to there's a catalyst to rebellion so anyway all that to say you know we learn from nehemiah he, he didn't need to be right he just needed to be about the work, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, and I think there's just like, we've got to know our enemy. And I think that was the one thing that I don't think we think a lot about. I mean, cause we have this picture of Satan and you know, all that, all that Hollywood and everybody else tries to paint is what this picture is. Um, but the reality is, is that man, he, he's an accuser of the brethren. Like that's his, when you read about him in the old Testament, here he is before God, which is kind of crazy to think. Mm-hmm accusing the saints you know just accusing the saints and and you you see that in the book of job where he's just here accusing the saints and all of a sudden god says hey have you have you considered my my servant Neom, um, uh, job mm-hmm. you know and you kind of think man like job got what he got because he was faithful right right and so so that that's that's just who he that's just who satan is he's the accuser of the brethren and so we've got to understand that like those things are always going to happen. And so when we, when we stop and start playing to that, then what have we done? Right. Right. Well, we, you know, Nehemiah's example is, is a good one for us to reference because, you know, there is in any verbal attack, there's some element of truth, right? Mm-hmm. You look at the, the insults that were launched at the Jewish people, they were weak. Right. They were tired. Right. They were discouraged. Yeah. They didn't have the greatest of resources. Right. And for every step forward, there were three back, you know, to build up, they had to, to get the rubble out. Yeah. 
And so there was an element of truth. No, it couldn't be done in one day. Right. And that was one of the things launched. But, you know, it just shows how strong Nehemiah's character was yep. to be able to, again, not just stop like we would think, hey, really? Yes. You know, there was no vicious rebuttal at that time. Well, and that's and that's not to say that, you know, that those insults don't hurt. Those insults mm-hmm. don't, you know, don't get to us. And we've lived long enough for those darts to be shot at us as well. And yeah. so we know that, you know, we hear that, we deal with that, and it's just, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, but it doesn't mean you're not human, right? Right. And, you know, that, and that's one thing I think that we have to think about building when we think about building. You know, I was talking to Brayden last night about uh, mental toughness mm. and how that, you know, she just started playing softball eight years old. It's a big deal in this area. Right. Mm-hmm. And so she wants to play softball, started playing softball. First time she's ever done anything organized sport or anything. And she's actually very good, yeah. which is so surprising because like Madison uh, of my three kids, Madison is probably the, the, well, the, the guys wouldn't agree with this, but she's the very gritty and very tough. Like Madison's mm. very gritty and very tough. Not so much in the athletic, you know, like athletically inclined. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, but man, grit and toughness mm-hmm. without question. And Braylon is like doing great, like catching the ball. She they got her playing third. She's catching the ball, wow. and she's getting it to first, and she's doing great in her hitting. Mm-hmm. And and so you know, I've had to kind of temper myself because I had to learn when I went to the first girls softball game. Have I, I haven't talked about this yet? Have I? No. I want to make sure because I, 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 you know, I forget. Um. Like, I'm wondering why, like, why aren't they, why isn't she tagging third? Why isn't she getting the ball to second? Like, all of these things. And it took me, like, four innings to figure out all they want these girls to do is catch the ball and hit the ball. Mm -hmm. Like, at that age, at that stage, because it's progressive, that's all you do. Yeah. Right? And so, so like, the first game I was at at the fence telling her all this, all this, and I could tell she's like, she didn't even know what was going on, you know. So, anyway, tempered that back. But we were talking last night about mental toughness and how important that is. Mm-hmm. That, like, you've got to be able to to be mentally tough. And I remember my dad, um, it's a funny story. So, my dad would always talk to us about being mentally tough. And so, he would uh, make me lay down on the floor, and he would uh, tickle my feet, and I could not laugh. Yikes. And he's like, <laughs> you're, he's like I'm going to do this, and you're going to lay there. And I'm going to keep doing it until you stop laughing. So at first it's like, uh, but then I realized he was serious, hmm. right? Because he was building in me. You got to overcome your obstacles. You know, you've got to mentally be able to overcome this. That's a big one. It's a huge one. If you're ticklish. Yes. Yeah. And so I would lay there and man, there he would go. And I mean, it was just like, you just have to grit it out, you know? And he go, okay, break. So I was, t- I was telling Brandon, so lay down and take your shoes off. She's like, no, I'm not doing no. it. You know, she goes, no, because she, they were practicing in the yard and, uh, she got, her mom was telling her she was sling, swinging too low or slow or something. And Braylon like got mad and threw her bat down. Nice. All right. Eight year old, typical eight year old mm-hmm. response. So I said, all right, so you give it. So we, so we work on mentally tough, mentally being mentally tough. Mm-hmm. So she said, Pappy, instead of tickling my feet, like just say stuff at me and just see if I can take it. <laughs> And I couldn't do it because it was like she wanted me to like to say, you're not any good. You can't swing it. You know, you can't yeah. hit the ball. You can't catch the ball. And I'm like, I did it like twice. I'm like, no, I can't do this <laughs> because I don't like the way it feels. You know, it makes me feel better. That yeah. you couldn't do No, hundred <laughs> percent. But I mean, you know, I think that it goes to say that we have to be, I mean, we have to, you know, the Bible talks about guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ mm-hmm. Jesus. Right. Uh, we will get to the helmet of salvation eventually. But I think that all of that has, has, you know, in our mental capacities of, you know what, I've got to, I've got to know my enemy and know what his tactics are. And I've got to protect myself from that because if I don't, then I'll internalize that. I'll take it personally. I'll attack the wrong thing. I'll attack people instead of praying mm-hmm. and understanding this is a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. That's true. That's true. So keeping along uh, that mindset of knowing the tactics of our enemy, we've kind of hit on the public humiliation that Nehemiah experienced. But you also talked about the confusion that arose in verses 7 through 9. Yeah, I I mean, to me, I think that was a light bulb moment for me when you began realizing, like, their tactic, what they wanted to do was, is let's just go start a bunch of little battles. Mm Mm-hmm. And let's start a battle here and a battle here and a battle here and a battle here and a battle here. And let's get them so confused that they're not going to know where we're coming from. And, and once they get confused, 
and and they get their attention on all these other little battles, then they'll they'll not do the work, mm-hmm. you know. And and it just it just made sense to me as I thought about, you know, we've been very busy the last couple of months and kind of where we are as a church and just it's just been busy and and that's there's not nothing wrong with that. It's just a busy time. Mm-hmm. But it's amazing how when you get so busy doing so many things and everything gets piled on and then you add things on that, man, you, you can catch yourself kind of losing focus, right, on on what, why are we doing all of this? Mm-hmm. Like, what is the purpose of all of this? And then you see in the midst of that, God's just blessing and God's God's doing because we just have to be faithful. Even when it's even when it seems confusing, you just got to keep pressing forward. Mm-hmm. Right, you got to keep doing the work. Yeah, and I think in that again, what a great lesson. You know, Nehemiah comes back and and he even says, he says, once the pe- once the, our enemies saw that we knew their schemes, our people went back to the work. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like I think there's something about us recognizing those things, seeing the. It doesn't mean they're not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were happening for them. You know, right. so they were being humiliated publicly. And now that now they're having to deal with all of these small fires all the time. I mean, I use the illustration of us being firefighters and putting out fires. And so they're putting out these fires all the time. And they're like, man, we don't have any time to really do the work. And so I, I think once, once they realized, and I think, so I think we've got to understand just because you recognize it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I think it's like, Oh, we recognize it. Okay, good. Well then the, no, I, I think, I think all of those things will happen. What we've got to do is we have to be able to recognize the source of where this is coming from mm-hmm. and then deal with it at the level it needs to be dealt with, right? Right. So, so it's not so much that, um, because here's what's crazy. Uh, we will have, it will affect our lives personally. Like it's not just the church world, right? right? We'll start seeing things popping up in our personal lives mm-hmm. and our family's lives and our kids' lives that were like, where'd this come from? Why now? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I said this to Julie the other day. We were, we were, uh, we were out spending some time Friday, and, um, and, and it was just one of those days that we both sensed, like, things were just a little tight, mm-hmm. you know? And she said something, and I kind of popped back in a, a little bit of an argumentative way, kind of like I needed to convince her I was right, and she wasn't. Mm-hmm. And then she kind of came back, and I'm like, Ooh, I don't like the way this feels. Yeah, you know, and so we just kind of got both got quiet. End of the day, we were kind of you know recon pop not reconciling, wasn't like we were fighting, but we were apologizing to each other. And I said, "Baby, listen," I said, "I feel like we both lost today mm-hmm. because I mean, here I am getting ready to preach a message on, um, you know, warnings from the wall, and it's Friday and Sunday's coming, and l- check this out." Yeah. You know, and I'm like, oh my goodness, we're mm-hmm. in the midst of all of this, yeah. right? And and uh, so, again, we, we have to be aware mm-hmm. because it's going to come and it's going to happen. And you, you don't you don't you don't get aggressive in God's work mm-hmm. for His glory and not think that you're not going to come up against the enemy. Right. That's right. And when we're dwelling in that confusion and that distraction, like you know, absolutely, we were Friday. Had you not recognized it and dealt with it, it could have rendered you ineffective oh, in with, presenting the message on Sunday. Without question. Because we can't move forward in ministry. Right. And we're all ministers of the gospel of right. Christ. Um, when we're we're living that confusion and that chaos, which is where the enemy would have us be. That's, Absol- that's his perfect um, everything. Absolutely. While we're in the, the state of confession. So I've become one of those people I said I never would. Um, Joey and I like to just kind of sit and relax at night and watch, um, usually shows about Alaska, you know, survival time. Yeah. Yeah. Joey shows. Um, but I've become that person with literally 30 seconds in the recliner. I'm, I'm asleep. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I, I'm shamed. <laughs> like, nice. Yeah. I always made fun of those people. I'm like, yeah. really? Cause yeah. I've always been a night owl, but we've been so busy. Um, that's just all I've got. And he has been so, so kind. You know, he really could rib me. I would have ribbed him about it. Right. Like, really, what are you doing over there? Yeah, 100%. You know, but he's been so accommodating. He, he gets it, you know. But, yeah. That's there interesting. I'm Yeah, I'm yeah. not. Well, I, I did Sunday. You know, I'm, I normally say I'm not the guy that sits in a chair and falls asleep 
But sure enough, man, mm-hmm. Sunday, you know, we put a show on, and I was like, uh, oh, yeah, that'll be great. Let's watch that. Yep, go on. And then I woke up, and the show was over. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, did I like, did I sleep long? She's like, oh, yeah, you just, like, missed the whole thing. <laughs> I'm like, man, yeah. yeah. It so, it, it, yeah, it's it's – it's amazing how it does. It is. Right. So that's me. Got to be aware of it. Just so you know, there's your visual for the day. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So moving on with your your notes on knowing the tactics of the enemy. We've talked about public humiliation and confusion, and now on to discouragement. discouragement. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's really what's interesting. Because I love it says in Judah, this was happening. So so it was actually working mm-hmm. right. Public humiliation, confusion, and now you've got. Inside the camp, they're mm-hmm. starting to kind of talk amongst each other, mm-hmm. other, and and you know, and I think Nehemiah is a good leader. Recognized that, called the people up and said, "Hey, look, guys, here's what's happening. Right? It's not that these things aren't real, but here's what it is. It's mm-hmm. a scheme. It's it's the enemy. So let's not spend our time dealing with that because that's what he wants us to do. You know, I love it when Paul says uh, that." We don't we don't wage war against the physical, right? We wage war in this, in a spiritual in a spiritual world. So our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, the darkness of the world. So you think about that, and here's what Satan wants to do: he wants to get flesh and blood fighting flesh and blood. Mm-hmm. So anytime, think about this: anytime we find ourselves in that situation, it's from the evil one, mm-hmm. right? So check that out. So like, how many times have we found ourselves? In a situation like that, and have not recognized, because oh, like I knew it Friday, like I knew it Friday. I said, and I hate to lose, and I'm like, really? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> but I was just like, man, like I couldn't believe it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so frustrating, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, but 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 that's that's his goal, you know. And and that's I think where the, the discouragement comes in. Yeah. Like, man, this, this isn't this is going to happen. Like, and it hit us from all sides. Oh, absolutely. You know, like Nehemiah's crew, you know, they were hit from all sides. They yes. were physically exhausted, mentally exhausted, and yet you've got insults being heaped at them and physical threats. Right. Are heaped. Yes. Again, just threats, luckily, but um, you know that that took a toll. Right. In every way. Right. And that happens to us, too. It absolutely does. You know, we, in our home, we've had, you know, I think I've spoke to this before, but we're just kind of digging out of a almost three year, I won't say slump because the Lord has brought us through, but it's been, it's been rough. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, from all sides. So <clears throat> yeah, discouragement can take us out if we um, don't get rid of the rubbish. Right. And start building up. Right. That's exactly right. So that was uh, topic number two. So we'll move on to topic number three, know the rules of engagement. And the first one was our enemy is spiritual and not yeah. physical. Yeah. And that's huge to recognize, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because because we we want to have something to target, mm-hmm. and we, and again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with um, always having to win the battle and somebody being right and somebody being wrong. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, I, I, if if I have a if I have this desire in me to be right, somebody's got to be wrong. I, I can't. I don't want to say it's spiritual because then I don't have anybody to blame. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I, th- I think that's just, that's the one thing that we need to realize that. And I think what that said to me last week was you, you can't fight spiritual battles with physical weapons. Mm-hmm. Like the way that we fight physical battles, you, you cannot fight spiritual battles that way. Right. You know, Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. Mm-hmm. And so, so we've got to be fighting with these spiritual, you know, weapons that we have. Right. And so, t- so many times we get focused on, Fighting with the physical, we neglect the spiritual. Absolutely. And that is just ultimately a failure, yeah. an epic failure on our yeah. part. So yeah. uh, the words of, of Paul in that are so critical to listen to. So second, our battle posture is to resist and stand. Yeah, I think I think this is probably surprising for a lot of people because when we think about evil, we think about fighting evil, fighting against evil. We want to speak to evil. You know, we want to do all these types of things. And, and I don't. You just don't see that in Scripture. I mean, the, the times that now I know you see Jesus doing that, right? And you know that Jesus gave his apostle his his apostles authority to do that, right, mm-hmm. for a period of time in their life. But but later on, you hear Paul say, and you hear James both say, "Resist the devil." Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Paul says in Ephesians six, "Stand firm mm-hmm. and resist." James says, "Resist the devil, and he will flee from you." Mm-hmm. 
so you, you don't really you don't really see this uh, that we're that we're to battle that like that's our posture, right? And I think we need to understand that is that is that we can fight the wrong battle, you know. And we'll get into that point in just a second when we're talking about charging the hill. Absolutely. So I'm going to give a quick example. Um, I think it was two summers ago, Cameron and I and uh, another team we led worship and Bible story time at a, a little camp. I think it was Camp Linden. Dave mm-hmm. Shelley roped us into that. It was mm-hmm. amazing. Um, but anyways, we're doing the Bible study lesson. I think it was kindergarten and first graders. Nice. Which I've never been a part of a camp experience where kindergarten and first grade kids sleep overnight. Yeah. So yeah. you've already got that element of physical just exhaustion. Sure. And then the anxiety that creeps in with that. Right. But this was the passage of Scripture that we used hmm. for that weekend. That was the the curriculum given to us. And so we're going through all of the pieces of armor. Nice. And so, you know, this was a day-to-day thing. We introduce a piece of armor. And so we get to the final day and we're reviewing the pieces of armor, you know, and we're asking, hey, what is this? What is this? Name this. And this little kindergarten, cute little fella, blonde hair, big blue eyes says, I know, I know. It's the helmet of starvation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I'm close. Nice. It does begin nice. with an S. Absolutely. But it shows you he was hungry. Yep. And so this this the physical crept into mm. his That's answer. That's true. That's exactly right. Because he got it. He had said it yeah. days prior. Right. But it just kind of got oh, the starvation. Helmet of starvation. So I was like, <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was just the cutest thing. So it was a great teaching moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and you got to put your armor on. I think that's something that, um, you know, that I think Paul reminds us of that we don't think enough about. Mm-hmm. Instead, if we're going to fight a spiritual battle, then we've got spiritual armor that mm-hmm. we should put on. And I, and I know I use the analogy of getting dressed in the morning. And, you know, it's just a good discipline for us to think about that every morning. Think about putting on the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, mm-hmm. the belt of truth. The, our feet shod with the gospel of peace, right? right. The sword of the spirit in my hand mm-hmm. and the shield of faith on my arm. So when I've got those six pieces, mm-hmm. and that's how, that's how I remember those things. I think, what are the, what's the number? And I make sure I'll scroll down the number, so that would be a good way to memorize that, mm-hmm. right? S- start from your head down to your feet, and you've got two hands, and something needs to be in each hand. Yeah. So that's a great way. That's that kind of how, how I memorize that. But, but if I know that, and I just kind of roll through that every morning, all right, you know, just as I've taken the mm-hmm. time, to get dressed, mm-hmm. then I want to make sure before I step out the door, spiritually I'm dressed for what I'm about to come up against. Yeah. You know, and, and I think every single piece of that armor has a purpose in our life. Mm-hmm. And I think we forget how important the helmet of salvation is because mm-hmm. that's where it starts. Right. Right. It starts with, because if he is the accuser of the brethren and he's a slanderer and he's a liar, well, then what is he going to do to me? He's going to be, he's going to be trying to speak into my life mm-hmm. things that are not true. What are, what, what's going to protect me from that? The helmet of salvation is going to protect me from that, mm-hmm. right? The shield of faith is going to protect me from that. The sword of the spirit that tells me that's not true is going to protect me from that. Right. You know, all those pieces are going to protect me from those darts that are coming because mm-hmm. they're coming. They're mm-hmm. coming every single day. Absolutely. And and if I'm going to resist and stand, then I've got to have those things that I can resist and stand behind. Mm-hmm. So if we've got our armor on if we're dressed then our effective strategy you mentioned is to pray, pray. And that's, and that's the crazy thing about it because Mm -hmm. you know, those of us who are doers and warriors and fighters and, and whatever else we want to do that. And Paul says, great, Mm -hmm. love the spirit. Yeah. Fight on your knees, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's so difficult Mm -hmm. when you want to go do something. It is. But, but you are doing something Mm -hmm. like there's nothing more powerful than our prayer. And when we're in the midst of battle, whatever it may be in our lives, we all face something or many things yeah. <laughs> sometimes um, t- simultaneously. But if our our go-to is to pray, then we're effectively partnering with Jesus, who made himself human. Right. Therefore, he experienced the battles that we That's do. That's exactly the right. The spiritual warfare. Yep. So he, he knows that. He understands it. He knows what it's like to be under attack, but he knows how to lead us to victory. Right. And so that's so <clears throat> often so hard for us to remember when we're walking through struggles, when we're walking through pain, trials, whatever it is, um, if we would just remember that. And it's yeah. so simple. That's right. Just remember we're not alone. How many right. times do we say that? Especially teaching our kids and our students here. You know, Miss Patty, I'm, why am I going through this? Why, yeah. why are my parents divorcing? 
why do I have this feeling? Why is this happening to me? And my go-to is, guys, you know, we may not know this side of heaven while you're walking through this. There may be an opportunity for you at some point to witness and to minister and help someone else through Mm -hmm. the same situation. We don't know. Right. But you're not going through this trial alone. Right. He's he's with you. Right. You just got to let him lead, and you've got to follow. Yeah. And and if you don't know the truth of Scripture that says, <clears throat> I was I was I met with a, a an old friend this morning for coffee, mm-hmm. and went to college with, and we caught up, and he was asking me about Julie, and he didn't know she had gotten sick, and you know, kind of gone through all mm-hmm. that, and he quoted Romans eight twenty eight. I was like, mm-hmm. man, exactly. You know that God works through all things mm-hmm. for those who love Him and call it, you know, all things for good. Uh, and and we were talking about the good that really has come out of her, her experience, mm-hmm. and but if you don't know that truth, yeah, you, you don't understand that. So you're thinking, right. and it's so it's so interesting to me that when you don't know God's truth and God's word, when you start going through something, here's what people will say: Why is God punishing me? Mm-hmm. What did I do wrong? Yep. Why am I being punished? I'm a good person. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 when you don't know the truth of the gospel. Mm-hmm. You don't understand that you're not being punished. Mm-hmm. God will never punish you. God punished his son for you. Mm-hmm. So for you to say you're being punished means he didn't punish his son enough. Oh, he punished his son more than enough, right? right. Or, or enough to, to, to satisfy his wrath. So, so when I find myself going through something, I know that there's something either that, that, that he's going to get good, that it's going to be good for me, mm-hmm. and it's going to bring him glory. Yeah. So I know that. So I can rest in that. It doesn't make it easy. Doesn't make it always make it easy, mm-hmm. but I know that that I'm right where He wants me to be, yeah. right? So that's the that's the the the, the belt of truth mm-hmm. that allows me to go through that and know mm-hmm. that it, that's not it. Now, are there times in our lives when we find ourselves in sin, need to repent of that sin and turn from that, and we and we deal with the consequences of that? Sure, there are, mm-hmm. but it's normally not in those times we're asking that question. Right. Normally, in those times, we know. You know, I mean, yeah. we can go out and make stupid decisions. Stupid choices and have mm-hmm. to deal with the consequences of that. Yeah, it's not what we're talking about. It's just, man, I, I'm like I'm pursuing life. I'm doing all that I feel like God's called me to do, and I still find myself mm-hmm. here. I find myself here. I find myself here. Yeah. Well, the belt of truth helps me keep that in context. It does. You know, I'm so thankful for those moments where the Lord just kind of gives you a glimpse of why I'm having you do this. Mm-hmm. You know, absolutely. It, it's not in every situation, but you know, I shared with our church family after or while Joey was going through his heart surgery. That was so unexpected and so shocking for us. He's healthy. Right. And for, you know, for him to go into um, just a routine test that resulted in, hey, you're not going home. Yeah. You're going to have quadruple bypass. Yeah. At his age. At his age, it's just crazy. We're just reeling from what? Yeah. What? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know, to kind of top it off, his his, um, heart surgeon was morbidly, morbidly obese. And so, you know, you find yourself going, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? How's that work? And again, that's that's just the human human response in that moment of shock to go, wait a minute, what? But long story sure. short, I, again, I've shared this with our church family, but just in that waiting room, it's such a long process to go through a mm-hmm. surgery like that. So, and of course, of COVID restrictions at that time, I didn't have a lot of people with me. Yeah. So I was kind of lonely yep. and definitely scared and, and still in a state of confusion and yeah. shock as to why, what, what in the world. Sure. But in that waiting room, uh, I think it was like 930 at night, still hadn't heard an update from the physician. But there, you know, there was this woman that had kind of been in and out all day long. So I'd seen her, locked eyes with her, smiled at her. But I remember seeing the doctor come to her and give her that bad news. Mm. That her husband didn't make it. Wow. And of course my immediate was, I'm, um, I'm going to be You're sick. You're next, yeah. I'm going to be sick. Yeah. This could be me in a minute. Right. But I'm not even kidding. The Lord was like, girl, lock it up. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a job for you. Yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, walked over to her, and I just knelt at her feet and took her hand hmm. and just said, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. I said, my husband's in surgery, too. I know where you've been all day. Yeah. And... I asked her his name. I asked her if she needed help, if she needed me to call someone. She didn't have anyone to call. Wow. So this woman was alone too. Yeah. And so in our aloneness, we were together. 
you know, obviously with the Lord guiding that whole process, but I was able to pray with someone who was grieving right, and lonely and potentially lost. And needed somebody. Needed someone. Yeah. So if, you know, and, and I told Joey that story uh, well after his recovery, and he was like, that's why I had surgery. Well, that's so funny he you say. It. Yes. Well, yeah. that's so funny you said that because I'm sitting here in my mind thinking, should I say this or should I not? It sounds insensitive, but it's really not. Mm-hmm. I mean, so what if mm-hmm. the only reason mm-hmm. Joey had quadruple bypass surgery mm-hmm. is so that you could be right there in that particular moment yeah. to pray with that woman who had mm-hmm. nobody when her husband died? Yeah. It's all worth it. I mean. He would do it again. That's the kind of guy he is. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, because that's, because God had, God had Joey. Like, mm-hmm. I, I got you, man. Like, your heart is in my hands. Right. You know, it's not in the, the other people's hands. So you're mm-hmm. good. I got you. But but I need Patty to be in this room, and mm-hmm. this is how I'm going to get her there yeah. to pray with that woman. I mean, yeah. we don't know that, but but it's what we know about God and His Word and what mm-hmm. it says. It's easy to put those pieces together mm-hmm. and know that yes, He loves that woman that much. Yeah, that He would do that absolutely. Yeah. And He gave me the words to say because I had nothing. Yeah. He gave me the strength to walk over there because I wanted to crumble on the floor. Absolutely. Well, so, because you didn't know if you were going to be next. Right. Right. But He took all that away. While I was doing that job. Yeah. And abs- after that, I had a piece. And it was probably within an hour and a half, I got a good response yeah, that's from awesome. his doctor. So, and again, that's not why. <laughs> sure, that's right. No, but, for sure. Um, definitely, obviously, thankful for that. But it was a, a beautiful moment and a great uh, reminder that we need to walk in obedience um, when the Lord has a job for us yes, to do. Just that's like very cool. Nehemiah, right. Um, and our last bullet point. Yeah, that's to me. That's that's like that's <laughs> is the our big battle one. cry. Yeah, that's the big yeah. one. I think a lot of people, uh, and I think Nehemiah teaches this so clearly, mm-hmm. and I think it's a great lesson for all of us. And you know what? There, may, I, I knew this preparing this. There may be people out there that will argue with this. That would say, "No, Jeff, you're wrong because you know Jesus cast demons out. He gave his disciples the authority to cast demons out. Mm-hmm. He told us that we were going to do greater things than he did. So surely we have the same authority." Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just, it, and, and, if, and, and I, when I read the scriptures and I, cause I think I, I would have thought that you know, when I was younger, because I want, I wanted to, to do that. Like I wanted, you know, like, I, like yeah. being a kind of a warrior, like I wanted to go after that piece of it. And, and the older I got, the more I realized when I started studying more of this word is that, you know, is if that's the case, then, then why would Paul say, you know, stand and resist. Mm-hmm. Why would James say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you? And then why do we have all these scriptures that deal with the battle belongs to the Lord? Mm-hmm. And, and so I'm thinking, it, and, and when you, when you mix that with Nehemiah, it makes perfect sense. The battle does belong to the Lord. Mm-hmm. The spiritual battle belongs to the Lord. And he's the one fighting that battle. He's the one protecting us from from all of that. And our focus, our heel that we charge is the work. Mm-hmm. Because the one thing that that he has called us to do is to be about the work. Yeah. Not not for his favor in our life, not mm-hmm. for uh, that so that he would love us or any of that. But that's just what, that's a privilege he's given us to be a part of, mm-hmm. just as he did Nehemiah. Like he called Nehemiah. Here's Nehemiah, a cupbearer who, who had, had was born in, in uh, Babylon, mm-hmm. in that area. Mm-hmm. He had never been to Jerusalem, only heard about Jerusalem, but yet he gets this passion about the people and about the wall. Like that's, that's, that's called God's mm-hmm. call is what that's called. Mm-hmm. When God puts a call in your life, nothing else will satisfy you until you accomplish God's call in your life. Right. And so he goes, and you know, I, I had, I had uh, uh, lunch with a, a pastor friend of mine that, who was at our church this past Sunday, and he retired from uh, being a pastor in, in the Hermitage area for a long time in a great church. He did a great job there. Led them through a lot of great transitions. And and we were talking about this. And he said, Jeff, you know, people ask me, what are you going to do now? He said, I'm going to continue my call. My call is to preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. And I'll keep doing that. It may not be at that particular mm-hmm. church, but I'll keep doing that because right. that's just the call in your life. Mm-hmm. And so we see that with Nehemiah. Nehemiah mm-hmm. recognized this, the, the best part of this book to me is – the reality that we've been called to be about the work and everything else in our life wants to distract us from the work period. Yeah. And so I can either spend my time thinking that I'm going to be about the battle of evil and, the, and, and, the, and, and getting into all of that and going around fighting that, or I'm going to be about the work. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, Satan, I believe, Satan wants to convince us that we are to fight evil. Because when we do that, guess what we're not doing? Mm-hmm. We're not going out there and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not making disciples. We're not expanding the kingdom of God. All the things that he, I, I truly believe when Jesus said, you will do greater things than even I have done. That's a, that's a crazy statement to think about Jesus making that statement. Yes. But here's what he knew was coming. He knew the church was coming. He knew the Holy Spirit was coming. And he knew that when the Holy Spirit came into us and empowered us to do what? To be his witnesses. So what does that mean? Go be about the work. Mm-hmm. Right? And so for Nehemiah, it was build the wall. And, and Sanballat later on is going to try to get Nehemiah off the wall. Hey, let's just have a conversation. Yeah. Hey, let's have a debate. Hey, let's get together and, and, and let's just, let's argue these things. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's so funny to me that I see all these guys going around having these theological debates. Mm-hmm. Who's that help? Right. Right. Who's that help? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're going to, we're going to get together and I'm going to argue premillennialism and you're going to argue postmillennialism. Okay. Who's that help? No one. Didn't help anybody. No. It just distracts us from the work, you know, be about the work. Mm-hmm. And so, um, Anyway, I, I just I just think we have to charge the hill, and the hill that we're supposed to charge, like for us right now, corporately is like God's called us, given us a vision, given us direction, and man, we're charging that hill, mm-hmm. right? And we've got to we've got to protect ourselves from uh, all the things that could come in and distract us from that. Right. Personally, I think we know that that like the hill that that Christ has called us to charge personally is like in our lives, man. Be the be the husband, be the wife, be the parent that God's called you to be. Mm-hmm. Make disciples in your home. Um, it, it, it was so neat when somebody had a question last week. Um, you know, how did how did Nehemiah have a relationship with God if there was no temple, they were in captivity and all of that? The great answer to that is Deuteronomy 6, mm-hmm. right? Because it was the job of the home to teach that to their kids. Right. That never stopped. Mm-hmm. Like, like they never quit telling the stories in the homes. Mm-hmm teaching in the homes, doing what, what, what God called them to do in the home. So they didn't need that, you know, now they wanted the temple back, sacrifices and all that. But the point is, is that that never stopped. Right. Right. I mean, if, if, if something happened today and all of our churches were gone, the gospel should not stop because homes should be continuing to teach the truth of God's word That's right. in That's the right. home. So, so we've got to, yeah, just a great lesson to me on, um, Charging the right heel mm-hmm. and realizing that, that as, as Nehemiah said, and I think it was 420, I, I'm not sure, but, but I think it was 420, where he told the people, when you hear the trumpet sound, mm-hmm. rally, because God's going to fight our battle for us. Mm-hmm. And, and basically his command to his people were, listen, yeah, there are battles going all around you, but don't worry about it, because God's fighting those battles for us. We're going to stay focused on what he's called us to do. Right. We're going to build the wall. Right. And even though they were scattered... To some degree, yeah, that brought them together. Uh, absolutely, and he recognized the the importance of unity. That's right. In in charging the hill, right? So important. So there you have it. Our battle cry is knowing that our God fights for us, and the battle ultimately belongs to it Him. Belongs to Him. Right? We got to remember that. So that's an amazing thing for us to remember and to end on. And I would ask that our our church body and fellow believers would keep our mission team in prayer. That yes. will be leaving on Thursday. Absolutely. And that's our, uh, I was going to say Boston. Greenville team. <laughs> but yeah, it's Greenville not Boston. Team, no. Boston's on my mind because I'm going there yep. soon. So our Greenville mission team will be leaving out on Thursday. So we wish them um, blessings as they bless others yep. and safety, obviously, as they um, set out. Absolutely. So they're excited yep. and, and we commissioned them yesterday. So um, if you guys would uh, definitely keep them in prayer and Cameron, we missed you, but we had ever so much fun today. We did. <laughs> we missed him, but we may let him come back. And we may play our music next weekend. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. See you next week.